Turn your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 4. Book of Revelation chapter 4 from verse 6 to 11. Revelation chapter 4 from verse 6 to 11. Last book in the Bible, the very last book in the Bible, chapter 4 from verse 6 to 11. If you there, say Amen. amen. The Bible says, In front of the throne was something like a sea of glass as clear as crystal. In the center of the throne and on each side of the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a human. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and were full of eyes inside and out. Without stopping day or night, they were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Verse 9. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fell down before the one sitting on the throne, and they worshipped him, who lives forever and ever, and threw their crowns before the throne, saying, O Lord, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power, because you created all things, for, for your will they were, they are, and were created. Hallelujah. Amen. Chapter 4 in Revelation speaks of a scene of throne room of God. Throne room of God is a place, exalted place, is the highest place that is revealed in the scripture where the glory of God is manifested. It's a place where the highest form of worship is released. It's a place where God releases his judgment upon the earth. It's a place where he also bestows mercy because everything happens in the throne room. Bible says, earth is his footstool and heaven is his home, is his abode. That's where he is. So when Bible speaks of the throne room, we get a glimpse of who God is because in every culture, until you visit somebody's house, you really don't know much about them. As you enter the lounge, from the painting on the walls to the music that plays in the house, it speaks volume of people who they are. And you suddenly realize, oh man, I didn't know that you also supported Manchester United, because you'll see a flag on the side. A home, a house speaks of somebody, speaks of their character, it speaks of who they are. The way they do things, what they cook, you can smell everything in a house. When you enter in a house, you can see and understand the caliber of people they are. If the house is dirty, you understand what's happening. If the, if the, if the family can't see eye to eye, you suddenly know that there's no peace in this house. There's no love in this house. If house, is, if house is smelling bad, you must understand that they don't clean. There's a lot of other elements involved in it. So house speak quite a bit to some of some people. Are you with me? Amen. Now when God says that earth is my footstool and heaven is my home, and then he starts to give us a glimpse of heaven. It means that he wants us to know him a little bit better than we know him. By having a glimpse of his throne room, we have a bit more of intimate knowledge of who he is. Because very rarely people will invite you to their home. Why? Because if they don't see you connected with them, there's no need for you to be in their house. You will not be welcomed and you will not be entertained. And when people come into your house, the people that you like, suddenly the teas are coming up. The cups you don't use normally every day, you will pull them out of the cupboard because they are left for the guests. A home speaks volume of people. 
and then God starts to reveal the heavens. Not many scriptures speaks of heaven. According to the word of God, Revelation speaks of the throne room. It speaks for me, even the creatures and, and the rainbow around the throne, the, the layout of the throne room of God speaks volume of God's character, his facet, his plan and purpose for, for humanity. He speaks of who he is. He speaks of what he can do. He speaks who he was. Amen. Now God started to minister to us about throne room in 2013. Some of the most powerful messages that came out. And right now I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book on face of an ox. And that's what I will share with you a little bit today. And God, God is really, really just pouring it out. And I strongly believe that the message of this chapter, which has been just a, a, a myth for many years and even decades, God is just revealing the word because he has a plan and purpose for the church. And the message in this chapter is very relevant to what's happening in the church of our time. Are you with me? Yes. Are you ready for a journey? Yes. Now, the Bible speaks in Revelation 4 of these four creatures. According to the word of God, there's four creatures beside the elders in the throne room. And the word of God says that they, each one has a face. One bears a face of a lion. The other one bears a face of an ox. Then you have a creature with the face of a man. And then the fourth creature is the face of a flying eagle. These are the cherubims according to the word of God because the second time these creatures are mentioned are in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 10. Ezekiel also speaks of these creatures and these are the only two references we find throughout the scriptures about the throne room of God and these four living creatures. Ezekiel goes to an extent in describing them as cherubims. Cherubims, firstly, are mentioned in Genesis 3 when Adam sinned. The Bible says God placed cherubims to guard the tree of life. Are you with me? That's the first time cherubims are mentioned. They were, they were holding the two-edged sword, which represents the word of God. And the Bible says they protected. They protected God's environment. Why? Because God is holy God. And Eden was a place where Adam could have a fellowship with this living God. So Eden was a holy place. Because God is not entertained or he doesn't rejoice in unholy places. He can only come and abode in holy places. That's why he had a scripture written for 1 Peter chapter 1 Peter 1 16. Be ye holy for I am holy. Why? Because if you want me, become like me. God mentions, the scripture mentions of these cherubims in Genesis. When God places them in Eden to protect his holy environment because sin has crept in Adam's life and God would not allow sin to be in a holy place. So he places the cherubims. They became the protector of God's holy presence. They became the carrier of God's glory. And they became the carrier of a two-edged sword, which was the word of God. Amen. Ezekiel speaks of these, these creatures and says, these are the cherubims. Are you with me? Yes. Now, these creatures, the cherubims, behold God's presence. They behold God's glory and they worship. Because we just read that they worship him without ceasing. Day and night. And we just read, when these creatures started to give glory to God, elders came out of the thrones, took their crowns, and laid it at in front of whom who was sitting at the throne. So they worship him without ceasing, and they reflect his glory. Because the word says, we read, when they gave glory and honor to God, those who sat at the throne laid down their crowns. Are you with me? In this prophetic scene in the throne room, there are three powerful insights of these creatures. Firstly, according to verse 8, they cry out God's holiness. What do they say? 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to. So there is a cry of holiness. That's the first assignment. They declare God's holiness. They declare his serenity. They declare his rulership because they say, who was, who is, and who is to come. It means he was the ruler of the earth. He is the sovereign over this earth. And he will remain the king over this earth. Amen. Secondly, according to verse 9, they give him glory. And thirdly, they worship. There's three elements that the throne room is charged with. Three cries. Three different cries we hear. First, we cry out, Holiness. Are you with me? Yeah. Then they reveal, they speak, they reflect God's glory to an extent that all the elders, when they see and hear God's glory coming out of these creatures, they just bow and worship. And secondly, there's an unceasing worship in the throne room. So the throne room of God is the atmosphere in the throne room of God is charged with the glory of God, with the worship of these creatures, and with the cry for holiness. So they, these three elements become the very purpose of these creatures being found in the throne room. Are you with me? Amen. That's their purpose. Cry of holiness, the glory of God in worship. Now, amazingly, we find that you and I have also these three elements of God inside of us. Holiness. And that's the scripture I'm supposed to quote. Be holy. For I am, God calls us to be holy. Hallelujah. He says, if you want me, you become like me. You want me, you want to follow me, become like me, be holy. Because unholy things can't have a fellowship with the holy God. So we have one thing in common with these creatures. Secondly, they reflect God's glory. Turn the Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 43 verse 7. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 7. To this, amen. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Bible says, to this, amen. amen. Everyone who is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Everyone. Bible says everyone that is called by my name, they're created for one purpose. And that purpose is God's glory. Amen. Some of us are looking for directions and purpose in life. Uh, there is a purpose. Isaiah 43 verse 7. That very purpose in your life, the reason of your existence is God's glory. Tell your neighbor and say, I was created for his glory. God speaking to his children and he says that everyone that is created, everyone that is called by my name is created for my glory. Amen. So we have the holiness of God common with these creatures because we ought to live holy lives. We are holy nation. God declares, commands us to be holy. Secondly, we are created for God's glory. And they are created for God's glory. We have two things in common with these creatures. <coughs> Hallelujah. Are you with me? Thirdly, what are they doing thirdly? They are worshipping Him. And each one of us are called to worship. The Spirit of God, such as two kind of people upon the face of the earth. According to the word of God in Ezekiel, he searches a man who can fill in the gap. He seeketh the intercessors, 
who can bear the yokes of Christ, filling in for people. Second time, the Spirit of God refers in the scriptures of searching people is those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. According to the Word of God in John chapter 4, the Bible says in verse 23, Jesus speaking to the woman at the Samaritan well says, Father, our is coming that the Father search those who can worship Him in spirit and in truth. An hour is coming now when the true sh worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such. He looks for people who can worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not with intellect and talents, all those are good. But God seeketh the worshippers with spirit and with truth. So the very purpose that you are created for is God's glory. To live a holy life and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And every creature in the throne room is created to declare God's holiness, live a holy life, reflect God's glory and to worship. So very purpose of your existence and very purpose of these creatures in the throne room is the same. Hallelujah. Are you with me now? Yes. We're getting somewhere. Hallelujah. Now, when Bible speaks of the new creature in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17, Bible says, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old has gone, behold, all have become new. Now, do you understand that according to the epistles of Paul, over and over, he says, neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor man, nor woman. He defies gender, race, and anything in the kingdom of God. And that's the reason when Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 about a believer becoming a new being in Christ Jesus, he says, a creature. He doesn't give it a gender, he says it's a creature. Now when Bible speaks of this creature mentioning, mentioning in the scripture, this creature, I strongly believe, has a likeness of man according to Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5. Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5 about this creature. Listen to this. All out of midst there came the likeness of four living creatures. He mentioned of these living creatures. This was their parents. What was their parents? Lion. Ox, man, and eagle. Listen to this. They had the likeness of a man. Ezekiel says, they bore these faces, but they had the likeness of man. They were creatures. They had the face of an ox, but the likeness was of a man. The likeness and then in the same chapter, he speaks of a man's hands. Revelation, John gives of a revelation of these creatures with the wings, six wings. Ezekiel goes to an extent and speaking of their hands, man hands. Face of an ox, but man hands. Likeness of man. Likeness of man that Paul speaks of. But a new creature. Now this new creature that Paul speaks of, I strongly believe it has a face of an ox. It has a face of a lion. It has a face of an eagle. And it has a face of a man. Every believer, because it serves the same purpose in his life to reflect God's glory and worship and live a holy life, bears the face of these creatures. Amen. Are you with me? Their purpose and existence in the presence of God is the same as a believer's purpose. Are you with me? This creature bears God's image, his likeness. That's the reason God goes into extent in his word, declaring them when he says in Isaiah 40, verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord, that they shall renew their strength and mount up wings as like eagles. 
It declares that the believers are like eagles. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Then he says in Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1. Righteous are like a lion. How can he say that? Because a righteous bear, a righteous man is a new creature when he accepts the Lord. When he's cleansed by his blood, he becomes a new creature. And that's the reason God says righteous is like a lion. Proverbs 28.1. Ezekiel says, verse 40, verse, chapter 40, verse 31, he says that they are like eagles. Hallelujah. And the word says they are like lions. And this is what I just set a foundation. And this is what I want to speak with you and I will give you a snippet. I'll, I doubt I'll be able to finish with you on these teachings. The bear, according to the word of God, in, in Isaiah, face of an eagle, the declared eagle, then in Proverbs, lion, the number, number chapter, and this is where we're going to focus today, number chapter 23, verse 22. Numbers chapter 23 verse 22. This is what God said in his word. God brought them out of Egypt. They are as strong as a wild ox. God declares his children, his people, that they are bold as lion. They will mount up wings like eagles. And they are as strong as a wild ox. We pay as this new creature in Christ Jesus the, the face of an eagle, the face of a lion, and the face of an ox. And the likeness of this being is the Adam that is restored back to God because the likeness of these creatures is likeness of a man, which is you and I. Yes, amen. Are you with me? Amen. So we're going to go today and I'm going to give you just snippets of ox. Hallelujah. Snippets of this creature of an ox. Because I strongly believe that the message of an ox is a very prophetic the creature that sits before the throne room of God day and night. Of all God's creation, God picked up three of these creatures and fourth one is a man. And there's a prophetic purpose. In the ox. Hallelujah. I strongly believe the missional mandate of the church is exactly what ox is sitting in the throne room. And we're going to dig deeper into it just now. Are you with me? Yes. Are you ready with it for a journey? Yes. Write down this. Eagle represents the values in a believer's life. Ox represents the abilities and strength and gracing and the anointing as well. I'll get in there. Lion speaks of the calling and man speaks of the purpose of these creatures in the throne room. Are you with me? Now, according to the word of God in Numbers chapter 23 verse 22, that they are as strong as an ox. Who are they? These are the people of God. These are the believers, blood-washed believers. You and I, God says, my children are as strong as an ox. And I was amazed. I was just telling Shane, you know what? They have all the scriptures that are like, look at that, Psalm 46. He says, God is our refuge and our strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The reservoir of God in this creature that every believer have an access to unmeasurable strength and power because ox is a symbol of strength. Hallelujah. When God speaks of people endured with strength, He speaks of oxen in the kingdom of God. They are as strong as an ox. They have strength, but not ordinary strength. Like anything. Anything can have strength. But they are as strong as an ox. Number says they are as strong as an ox. Are you with me? Amen. Now, according to the word of God, there was a tribe in Israel. The twelve, twelve tribes of Israel. According to the word of God, one of them was Ephraim. Everybody say Ephraim. Ephraim. Now, Ephraim and tribe had a mandate to defend Israel. Each tribe had different responsibilities. Some were carpenters, the other one were 
blacksmiths and, and, and jewelers and you find farmers and even Levites who perform the duties. Each one was skilled in their own category, but when it comes to Ephraim, Ephraim was a warrior. Ephraim's lineage, we find Joshua, those, those who conquered, those, those who saw the armies of Canaan and said, this is nothing, and Bible says they conquered. He was the one that he commanded, Bible says in Joshua 5, that he declared and son stood still until he conquered. He was an Ephraimite. These, this tribe in the scripture was a warlord. They were the warriors. Their responsibility and duty was to protect Israel from his enemy. They also developed in Shalom and Bethel, which was a place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. They were the protector of God's covenants with his people. They dwelt in Shaul, the most holy place in Israel. No other tribe was allowed because they were the warriors. They were the, the mighty men of Ephraim. And they were appointed to protect God's covenant. Ark of the covenant. They were the one who phased David into kingship. They were the one who brought whoever they wanted because they were the defense forces. They had the power. No one could stand before them. And when Israel light was di Israel divided was in northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, they became literally the face of the northern kingdom because the ten tribes joined Judah and the other one other stayed one side and Ten others were part of Ephraim's tribe and they became the face of the nation. They were mighty warriors and powerful people. Are you with me? Their study becomes very intense even as you go into who these people were. According to the word of God, are you with me? We're doing some teachings here today. I'm supposed to preach but we are doing some teachings. <laughs> Hallelujah. Deuteronomy, turns your Bible with me to Deuteronomy, chapter 20, uh, 33, verse 17. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Amen. My God. <laughs> Half of my time is gone. How, how, much, how much minute I have? <laughs> my word. Chapter 4 of 200, Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, verse 17. In custom, a Jewish custom, you find that whenever the, the elderly are sick and they know that the time has come, it's always a very prophetic time, a very prophetic season. And what happens that they call for their lineage, for their grandchildren and their sons so they can bestow blessings upon their lives. Understand that? I don't know if it happens here, but back home it happened. My grandfather stayed three nights with us before I left to South Africa. And he told my father, I will not be able to see Ishtiak. I want you to leave him with me. I'm coming to visit you and I want the door to be locked. No one must come in, no one must go out. That was my grandfather. He had a very powerful prophetic mental. And my, my father didn't understand. He says, no, Pa, you will be still living because he lived, I think, 98 years old. He, was, he lived long. And he, my, grand, my father said, no, Pa, don't say like that. You will be, he, will, he will definitely see you again. He says, don't tell me what I need to do. Just do as I say to you. I'm coming to visit your house. Allocate me one room and no one must come in that room beside Ishtiak for three days. I will stay in there for three days. And don't give him any of the duties of the house. I need to spend time with this young man before I depart. And that was just a month before I left to South Africa. I never knew that I would never be able to see him again. He was a prophet of God. Prophet, not just prophesying, he will tell you don't take this road. And if you took, you would meet a nation. He was that kind of prophet. He will tell you, he will warn you things that will happen. And then I remembered every night around 12, 1 o'clock, I'll be sleeping on the floor. He's on the bed, this small room there. And then he will tap me, he'll say, I come pray with me. And he'll lay hand and, and he just pray over me. For three days he did that. Uh -huh. Days and nights he did that. I was not allowed to, to wash the dishes or buy the, the groceries or do anything. And I was just locked up with this old man in that room. 
And when he start to open his mouth in tongues, I tell you, you hear even the, the hair on your head will stand like, you know. He was a powerful man, spiritual man. And there was impartation, and that is the culture. That's the culture in the Eastern countries where I come from. And now, what we're reading in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 17, is a very customary thing happening. Moses is on his deathbed. Moses is on his deathbed, and these are blessings called final blessings. These are the blessings that Jacob bestowed upon Esau, and, and you, uh, sorry, Isaac bestowed upon Jacob and Esau, and you find that these, this pattern throughout the scripture, that Abraham bestowed blessings upon Ishmael and also Isaac. Now Moses is on his deathbed and the Bible says all the twelve tribes are there before him. Are you with me? Amen. And listen to this verse 17 when he comes to Ephraim what he has to say. Verse 17 if they say amen. amen. He says his glory is like the firstborn of his bull and his horns are like the horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, they are the thousands of Manasseh. Moses in his deathbed had a vision, a prophetic vision of this tribe. And Bible says he prayed for each one of them. When he came to Ephraim, he said, His strength will be the strength of a wild ox, and with that he will go the nations. With that he will reach the ends of the earth. He says, these are the 10,000, these are the thousands of Ephraim. I see God bestowing extraordinary strength and purpose over their lives that they will be able to reach the ends of the earth. They will carry the banner of Jehovah and reach outside of Israel. You must understand that all the other 11 tribes had the duty inside the camp. Every other tribe had the duties inside the camp, but not Ephraim. Ephraim had a mandate and calling to lift up the banner of Jehovah and enter into new territories. He was assigned to conquer Canaan. He was assigned to conquer every territory where they step would tread in. Their calling, their purpose was outside. Of Israel's camp. And that's what Moses says. He says, His strength, Ephraim's strength is like the firstborn of his bull, and his horns are like the horns of a wild ox. And with those horns, he will go to the nation, then he will reach the ends of the earth. If you go into a prophetic image of this, this ox, as we start to discover about the character and the, and the structure of the ox, and I doubt that will reach into the home speaks of God's anointing throughout the scripture. That's why prophet was assigned to carry a horn, because anointing will not take place without the anointing horn. All had to flow from the horn to come out. What was that prophetic image? It was the prophetic image of the ox. It spoke of anointing. He says, with that, with those horns, his horns are like the horns of a wild ox. He is seeing this young man in front of him, but he sees horn on his head. Sad to say that the world has everything that the God intended for beauty and for a purpose. Enemy took it and made it evil. Throughout the scriptures, there's no reference of Satan having horns. In fact, in, in Corinthians, in the epistle of Corinthians, Paul speaks of Satan disguising himself an angel of light, beautiful. Ezekiel goes into extent describing Lucifer as the most beautiful creature. Whereas when the wolf portrays horns, it gives it to Satan. Because straight throughout the scripture, Satan is not mentioned with horns or wings. Horns were an image of God. They represented God's anointing and strength for his people. But enemy took it and marred it. Now somebody want to, God, want to get a costume for a, for a Satan or whatever, they get a horn. Meanwhile, it's the image of power and ability and God's strength. Hallelujah. And he says that with those he will go to the nations because I'll be so strength upon his head. I'll be so anointing upon those horns and he will be able to go to the nations with that. Are you with me? Are you still with me? Now that was a prophetic prayer of, of Moses to Ephraim. And according to the word of God, these were the blessings that if 
Moses besought each one of them and he spoke an extraordinary strength on Ephraim. Hallelujah. Amen. Now who was Ephraim of these 12 tribes? Who was Ephraim? Ephraim was the second born of Joseph. Are you with me? Amen. Second born of Joseph. Turn your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 41. There's a lot of scriptures coming in. I'm trying to condense as much as I can. But if you have pen and paper, just write it down. Genesis chapter 41, verse 51 to 52. Ephraim became, literally, they had, they had a flag. Each tribe had a flag. Ephraim's tribe had an image of an ox on it. Ox became their identity because of the prophetic prayer of Moses. Ox became their face. Who was it for him? Genesis chapter 41, verse 51 to 52. This is Joseph. Listen to this very powerful portion of scripture as we dig deeper into the image of an ox. Who are the ox people? And there's characters of ox as well. Genesis chapter 41, verse 50, 51 to 52. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Everybody say Manasseh. Yeah. Saying, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Verse 52, and the name of the second he called Ephraim, saying, For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Who is this? Joseph. Joseph holds his firstborn and calls him Manasseh. Everybody say Manasseh. Manasseh, Manasseh means God has made me to forget my father's house. Why father's house? Because the father's house was very painful for him. That was a place where his brother sold him into slavery. The hurt was still very deep there. And the Bible says when he held his first child in Egypt, he calls his child Ephraim because he realized that God has caused him, God has made him to forget his father's house. Are you with me? Amen. Now the Bible says, according to the word of God, they, Manasseh was born, and as he held, he thought of what he went through. And he realized that I need to move forward. And unless I forget, I can't. Manasseh became a constant reminder in Joseph's life to forget the hurt and carry on. But how many of you know that you can forget the hurt, but it does not mean that you have been healed of the hurt? That's the reason when he sees his brothers after many years, the Bible says he wept bitterly that even the Egyptians heard him. Why? Why would he weep? Because the hurt was still there. He tried to forget it, but he could not. You can pretend, you can put it under the carpet, but the wounds don't get healed by forgetting it. Issues don't get settled by forgetting it. You've got to deal with them. That's the reason true healing can take place. That's, that's where true healing can take place. Manasseh was a temporary solution in Joseph's life. That I got to forget for me to move forward, but the hurt was still there, and it's evident throughout Genesis. Whenever he saw his brothers, he wept, he wept, he wept, until he couldn't hide his tears and he confronted them. And the restoration took place. Bible says he holds his second bone and calls in Ephraim. Now Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. First one was God has made me forget. Hallelujah. Second one was now, Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Hallelujah. Amen. He said that, he saw this child and he said, you know what? I keep, I want to forget my barren places because he had barren places. He had afflictions given to him by his own brothers and family and he was sold into slavery and he was, he was falsely accused in Potiphar's house. He was put in prison. There was tragedy in every corner in Joseph's life. There were barren places, afflicted places, troubled places in his life. And when he held it for him, he says, you know what? God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. It means I've got a barren place, but I'm not going to forget it anymore. Why? 
because God has given me a son, Ephraim, because what Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy, Joseph had the same prophetic image. Why? Because when he held Ephraim, he saw an oxen in Ephraim. And you must understand that oxen are the only creature endued with enough power to till a barren place. Oxen are the one that are created and have a structure to put a yoke on their shoulders and place them in a barren land and they will till the ground uh, so until it can bear the fruit. When Joseph held his second born, he says, My God, I'm no more going to forget my barren places. God has given me an oxen and I'm going to till my barren places. I'm going to till my afflicted places because... God will cause me to be fruitful in that barren land. Joseph had an image of a little oxen when he held Ephraim. He says, no more. So much hurt I've been through from my family, from my masters, from everybody. No more, I'm going to forget my hurt and think I'm going to carry on. I'm going to plow in my barren places. I want reward from those barren places. I'm not giving up on those barren places. Afflicted places in my marriage. Afflicted places in my finances. Barren places in my relationship. I'm going to till because I have fence of an ox. A barren ox in my hand. And there's no way I'm going to forget these places anymore. I'm going to deal them and deal them properly until God brings forth fruit. Amen. Tell your neighbor, don't give up your barren places. Tell them, don't settle for Manessa. Come on, tell them, don't settle for Manessa. Hallelujah. Amen. We're not looking for temporary solutions. No. My God. We're getting into those afflicted places and barren places and we're going to see the fruit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. No more we're going to abandon the barren places in our lives and move on. Now we're going to deal with them properly. We want the fruit because God has caused me to be fruitful. Are you with me? Hallelujah. God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my rich. That's the creature of an ox. According to Moses, your strength, your strength of firstborn of your bulls and your horns, horns of a wild ox, carry strength. God, people carry strength of an ox. God causes us to be fruitful. Hosea also speaks of Ephraim and relates to him as an ox. Bible says in Hosea chapter 10 verse 11, and Ephraim is an ox. Hallelujah. Ephraim is as an ox that is taught. I'm not going to go through these scriptures, but I want to just touch base on a couple of things. There's the calling of Ephraim is very much of the calling of the church. Why I'm saying that is, and the creature that is in the throne room speaks of the children of God, believers of God, because the missional mandate of the church and Ephraim is the same. Church is called outside of his walls. Amen. You understand that? Ephraim was called outside of the camp. With that you will go the nations. How about Jesus speaking to his disciples, his last words? Matthew 28 verse 19. Go into all the world, then preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Go into all the world, to all nations. And behold, I will be with you till the end of the age. That is the missional mandate, the purpose of the church. Outside of his boundaries, outside of his walls, exactly what was spoken over Ephraim. With that he would go to the nations. With what? With the horns. Horns of what? Anointing. God bestowed anointing. The Bible says in, 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 in the book of Acts, when the Spirit of God came upon them, Except one more sake, but the Bible says, when the Spirit of God will come upon you, you will receive power, you will receive strength. For what? To be my witnesses. Amen. Anointing is bestowed upon for a purpose. What is anointing? Anointing is being called, set apart for a purpose. 
Being anointed means to be set apart for a purpose. Anointing is bestowed upon our lives for a purpose. Anointing is given to us. The power of the Spirit of God is given to us for a purpose. And what is that purpose? To witness. And you will be my, the power of God will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Everything else, healing, blessing, everything else is bypassed. But the ultimate purpose of the church is outside of its walls. Hallelujah. Amen. Exactly what Ephraim was called to do. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Hallelujah. My time is up. No. I'm preaching to you for 50 minutes. Can I carry on? I don't know. We haven't even touched the character of an ox. Just laid a foundation. I want to hear, I don't want to, I don't want to mess up today, especially not today. Because <laughs> I preach is too long. <laughs> Tell me, please. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Tell me, please. Ah. Character of an ox. What is the character of an ox? Firstly, they are very forceful, forceful creatures. So much so, when the when the stampede happens in a wild life. No one day comes across the stampede of oxen. You must understand that when they move, they're very forceful. If it's a lion, whoever, even the elephants must make a way because that stampede can trample anything. They are forceful in their approach. Very forceful. And when they're heading towards something, they create new paths for the other creatures around them. They are the trendsetters. Because of their forceful nature, when they are in the environment, the wild environment, and that stampede happens, where they run towards one place together, no one comes in the path, every other creature steps aside and watch which new path they're creating now. Because even if it's a small hill, they will flatten it. Even if it's a bush, or whatever, which no other creature could go across, when they move with their force, they flatten it. They create new paths, they create new territories, and when they go through the rivers as well, in that stampede, because of their forceful nature, they open new streams. That's the character of an ox. Every creature stands, looks aside and says, God, we've got to see what new paths we're going to get. We've got to see what bushes are going to go down and which stones are going to be trampled and what paths they're going to create for us. First nature, character of an ox is forceful. According to the word of God in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, the kingdom of God suffer violence. And violent men bearing the face of an ox will take it by force. Calling of the church as of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffer violence. The kingdom of God is taken, is established, is spoken by force. It speaks of the nature and character knocks in a believer in the church and until the church become forceful in the approach that's where the faith comes in yes. hallelujah yes. we're moving in direction we're not led by our eyes we're led by the spirit we're moving and moving we're moving forcefully we're not we're not faced by what comes in front of us we are moving because god has commanded and in that forceful approach, we accomplish much for the kingdom of God. They are strong, and we have gone through that scripture, 23, chapter 23 of Numbers 22. Secondly, they are a symbol of strength, power, respect, and anointing. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go all through this. Write down this scripture. Write down the scriptures. Psalms 92 verse 10. The Bible says, You shall lift up my horn as the wild ox. This is David speaking. 
Hallelujah. And I think I should close with this, otherwise we're going to keep you whole day here. The Bible says in, in Psalm, the book of Psalm, chapter 92, verse 10. But you shall lift up my horns as, as, as the wild ox. And I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Now how come David wanted to be an ox? We have the church, the believers, already declared oxen by, the God, by God. What he desired, we are given. He says, exalt my horns. David sees spiritual horns upon his head. And he says, you shall lift up my horns as the wild ox. Give me strength. And anoint me and I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Throughout the scriptures, horns become an image of the anointing of God. Because the anointing would not take place without the anointing horns. Prophet would carry it to then kings and prophets and establish kingdoms. Horns become an ultimate image of anointing and power. And David says, exalt my horn and anoint me with the fresh oil. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Isaiah speaks of the anointing. And I want to close with this. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27. It's a very famous portion of scripture and you all know about it. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from thy shoulder and his yoke from thy neck. And you, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Very famous portion of scripture. The Bible says, the yokes will be broken because of the anointing. The yokes will be broken because of the... And we quote this scripture. Now, do you know, no other creature has a structure, bodily structure, to bear the yoke. You can't place a yoke on a goat. Understand that? You can't place a yoke on a donkey. Because they're not created, they're not made for it. When Isaiah speaks of the yokes being broken, yokes are placed upon who? He speaks on, of, of the children of God and he sees them as oxen. Because no other yoke, no other creature can bear the yoke. He says the yokes will be broken because of the anointing. Yoke upon who? If you're not built for that, how can you even say that I have it? Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, sees the believers as oxen. And he says, because of the anointing. Throughout the scriptures, oxen and horns are related to the anointing of God. And I want to close with this. Uh, we, we grew up in farm in Pakistan. I'm from a Punjabi tribe. Okay. Punjabi clothes, they come from my province. Biryani come from my province. Naan, naan, roti, from a very small province. But we're very famous. Bangra, Bangra music. <laughs> that's our tradition. So that's my lineage. That's my inheritance. I love it and I thank God for it because it's God ordained. Hallelujah. He would have put me anywhere, but he put me amongst the Punjabis. By the grace of God, I pass it Punjabis, Hindis, Telugus, Tamils, English, and Zulu speaking people. Hallelujah. So he has been very, very gracious to me. Very gracious. One of the fond memories of my childhood was Punjabis are farmers. My grandpa was a farmer. He had roughly 20 oxen. Amen? Now, when the baby ox is born, he's very beautiful. He has this silk, silk hair, very dark, adorable. And I had the privilege of witnessing such birds. In fact, one became my pet. And every summer holidays, I'm in the farm with my grandpa, and I should enjoy my time with this ox. And he, they, because the Bible says in Hosea, we read, when, when Uzziah speaks of Ephraim, he says, Ephraim is an ox that is taught. Do you know that they can be, they're the only creature of the wild that can be domesticated. Now, 
we what what happens after his birth within couple of minutes is on his feet yes. hallelujah that's why when, when the gospel was preaching in Acts 3, when the gospel was preached, the brand new believers were converting others. They were endured with strength and gracing, being born again within days and hours. And when you were born again, suddenly you were reaching out to others about your love for Jesus. The nature of ox was in you. They, after a couple of minutes of their birth, as they fall, they just try to walk and next thing you know, they're on their feet. They walk around. Beautiful thing about ox baby is that you can, you call it calf. You put a belt around his neck and you can tie him up. He's very playful. He's very, he doesn't realize the strength that he has, even as small as he is. So he can just jump on you from the back. He doesn't know better yet. But he's beautiful and you can really domesticate him, teach him from young age. So you tie him up and he's fine. Do you know that as he starts to develop, you don't need to take the, take the belt out of his neck because the shoulder muscle starts to develop. And when the shoulder muscle starts to develop, that belt is broken off itself. You wake up the next morning and the ox is gone and you're like, what has happened? But because he's domesticated, he's taught from a young, young age, even his few months, he will come back home. And then you circle him around and actually the belt overnight just fell off. And he's gone and in the morning he comes back home because he's hungry now. And he's playing with you. He's like, you know, he's playing and like, what on earth? And then you change the chain for the next phase. And you know what? Again, he's building up. And as the muscles grow, as the muscles grow, suddenly that chain is broken and you wake up in the morning. Where is he now? And then he's gone and then he comes back. He comes back home and then you change every time. Because every time there's development, you can't contain him. The yoke every time breaks off without an effort because the strength within him is developing to a greater extent and no chain can hold him back. To a point where you end up tying him with the tree literally. And if he's not tamed and domesticated and taught properly according to the word of God. You are in a big mess. Because you don't know how to handle his strength when he's grown up. But if he's channeled properly man he can be one of the best things you can ever have. You must understand that. The strength in this creature is of God. Why I'm saying that is, he eats green grass, he's black, he eats green grass, he gives white milk and pink meat. <laughs> now put your human mind together, black ox eats green grass, gives milk and pink meat, white milk and pink meat. How on earth that happens? If he's black, he's supposed to give black milk. <laughs> Understand that? It, 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 we can't comprehend it because that's why the strength that they have is of God. It's the wisdom of God. And many of us, we eat green. Come on, not to lose weight. <laughs> we eat grass to lose. But he eats that and he picks up the weight. In your human mind, you tell me without protein, you can put up muscles. It could only be God that he can eat the green grass and put up the muscles to pull the tongues of weight. It can be the wisdom of God. It can be the God, nature, God, God facet is strength in him to do the, such things. And that's the beauty of this creature. And I'm done because you're going no way. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet this morning.